Right, well, we'll make a start and uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Landmark Chambers webinar, uh, Developing in the Green Belt. We're delighted to have so many of you on the on the webinar. And of course, we hope that you will find the presentations uh, that you'll hear this morning to be useful and informative. So my name is Robert Walton. Uh, I'll chair the session today and you'll be uh, uh, hearing also from my colleagues. We've got John Lytton, QC, who will be talking about uh, the, how you look at the impact on openness. We've got uh, Matt Reed dealing with housing uh, numbers. Then we've got, uh, we've got Kate Holly on uh, the paragraph 145 exceptions. Jenny Wigley dealing with uh, exceptional circumstances and taking land out of the green belt. Matt Dale Harris doing uh, a review of some of the appeal decisions. Uh, and then Nick Grant dealing with reform. Now, uh, to be begin with, though, just uh, some housekeeping points. Your microphones and your videos are muted, so you don't need to adjust your local settings. We very much welcome your questions. There's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, so type your questions into the, into the tab, and we will endeavour to ask, answer as many of those questions as we can at the end. The webinar is going to be recorded and you'll get a link at the end uh, and so the slides will be there uh, and also the, the presentation and finally if your uh, link if you lose your link at any point uh, please just click back on the original invite and you will uh, hopefully join us once again so without uh, any further ado uh, if we can have jenny wigley uh, dealing with exceptional circumstances Good morning. And um, as Rob said, I'm going to be talking about uh, exceptional circumstances and removing land uh, from the Greenbelt. Um, I thought I'd start just with a reminder of the policy framework in this area. So the policy framework for Green Greenbelt release is set out, as, as everyone will know, in the MPPF at paragraphs 136 to 139. And there's a familiar phrase that once established, um, green belt boundaries should only be altered where exceptional circumstances are fully evidenced and justified uh, through the preparation or updating of development plans. So the need for any change to a uh, green belt boundary has to be established through the strategic level policies. Um, and that has to be uh, done with a view to uh, having regard to their intended permanence in the long term so that the green belt boundaries can endure beyond the plan period. Now, just, just thinking of that for a moment, that should mean that there should not be a need to review green belt boundaries every time a local plan is reviewed or every time there's a new local plan. But of course, that's quite often not the case and hasn't generally worked in practice. So once the need for uh, alteration of green belt boundaries has been established, then the detailed boundaries themselves can be adjusted through the non-strategic level policies. And that includes, of course, neighbourhood plan policies. So that's the um, that, that's the outline. Next slide, please, Josh. Um, there's no uh, definition of exceptional circumstances, either in law or in policy. And the courts have described that uh, the reason for that is that the policymakers have left that uh, definition deliberately broad. But uh, that's not to say it's entirely untrammeled. Um, before concluding that exceptional circumstances exist, uh, the policy requires that strategic, strategic plan making bodies must demonstrate that they've examined fully all other reasonable options for meeting the development need. And that includes looking at suitable brownfield site sites, underutilised land, optimising density standards, particularly obviously in urban areas, and the possibility for neighbouring authorities to accommodate some of the identified need through the duty to uh, cooperate. Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, and as part of that consideration, uh, an important factor is the need to promote sustainable patterns of development. So authorities need to consider how the green belt boundaries interrelate with those sustainable patterns and the consequences of either leaving green belt, belt boundaries in place or altering them on, for example, any consequential need to allocate land beyond the green belt, which may be unsustainable, 
or in villages within the green belt, which may also be unsustainable. So looking at the consistency between sustainability requirements and green belt boundaries uh, that, that exist. Uh, and once it's been decided to remove the land from the green belt, uh, authorities have to consider offsetting that deficit by compensatory improvements for the remaining green belt land in terms of environmental quality and accessibility. Uh, they should ensure consistency between the development plan strategy for sustainable development and the green belt boundary and once decided to alter the familiar uh, tests as to what land should be removed uh, in terms of development control base uh, 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 the development control criteria um, come into play such as um, ensuring that uh, you keep in the in the green belt land that needs to be kept permanently open and uh, the corollary of that is that do not keep in land that is unnecessary to keep permanently open and of course consider the green belt purposes. Um, <clears throat> as part of ensuring endurance beyond the plan period, it's necessary to identify areas of safeguarded land and reserve sites that will be removed from the green belt but will not be released necessarily during the plan period so that the green belt can endure beyond that period. And lastly, it's important to set the Greenbelt boundary uh, according to legible and permanent boundaries, which can be seen by reference to existing physical features uh, and so can be readily understood. So that's just a very quick run through the, the policy framework. Um, and moving on now then to the court's approach to exceptional circumstances and in particular to challenges to decision makers approaches to uh, what constitutes exceptional circumstances and whether they have been adequately established in any particular case. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit here about the uh, relatively recent decision of Sir Duncan Oosley in the Compton Parish Council against Guildford Borough Council case, which was decided in December last year. Now, in uh, Guildford, it was established that the objectively assessed need for housing was at a figure of 10,600 or so dwellings. And the uh, authority intended to meet that need by a supply surpassing it of 14,600 odd, which included over 6,000 dwellings to be provided in, on Greenbelt land. Um, that was challenged uh, both in principle and in the extent of the Greenbelt release uh, in the High Court. Um, and the, 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 the bases for that challenge were on, on a number of grounds. Uh, first, the familiar idea that the inspector had treated the, the normal as exceptional. So a challenge to the fundamental uh, definition of what is exceptional. Uh, it was argued that the inspector had not been rational or had not provided adequate reasons for the Greenbelt releases in circumstances where those releases resulted in some 4,000 odd dwellings being provided above the objectively assessed needs. It was argued, well, how can that be except, how can there be exceptional grounds for releasing those when they're not needed um, to meet the need? And uh, there was then a challenge on the basis of the lack of consideration of the scope for leaving some unmet need to reflect Greenbelt constraints. Um, and of course, there is provision both in the 2012 MPPF and in the 19 uh, MPPF for a decision maker to, at the policy on stage, decide not to meet the objectively assessed need if there are specific policies which indicate uh, restriction or in, in, in the uh, 2019 um, framework where there are uh, policies uh, which uh, provide a strong reason for restricting the overall scale of development. It was argued well that allows authorities to rely on greenbelt policies in order to not meet their objectively assessed need and that should have been considered more fully by the inspector. That was the argument. And lastly, there was an argument on the basis of the SEA regulation, Strategic Environmental Assessment, that there had not been adequate consideration of reasonable alternatives 
uh, particularly at the point when the objectively assess, assess need had reduced from over 12,000 to just over 10,000. And in those circumstances, the claimants argue there should have been a full review, a new environmental report, uh, considering alternatives to the large number of greenbelt releases that were, that were proposed, and in particular that some large strategic sites should have been removed at that stage. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now, it's important uh, uh, to read the case as a very good example, I would say, of inspectors' reasons. The first 10 to 20 pages of the judgment sets out the inspectors' reasons on uh, the Greenbelt's uh, exceptional circumstances uh, issues. And it is, I think, quite full and extensive. It refers to the, the inspector refers to many more relevant factors than simply the unmet need itself. And he expressly addressed um, all the various features of the Greenbelt release in terms of not just exceptional circumstances themselves, but the basis for having the headroom in the OAN, the consideration of alternatives, and that specific point about policy on and whether there was just any could be justification for not meeting the objectively assessed need. Um, he also considered exceptional circumstances at both the strategic level and at the local level of the individual sites and considered the impacts on the openness and purposes of the Greenbelt in those terms. And in addressing all those issues, he um, emphasised the integrated nature of the proposals, how the allocations across the district, um, across the borough, uh, interrelated and were, were interdependent. So, for example, there was an importance of having both small and strategic sites in the green belt to future proof the trajectory so that the small sites could come in in the earlier years when the strategic sites wouldn't be ready to deliver. And that was against the background of a persistent shortfall in delivery of a high need for affordable housing and ongoing deteriorating affordability generally, the need to meet a neighbouring authorities unmet need. Uh, the contribution of the sites that were going to be released to infrastructure, uh, transport infrastructure, park and ride, railway stations, and other benefits in terms of delivering employment land and gypsy and traveller sites which were intended on those sites. <clears throat> and also how the Greenbelt releases fitted with the overall sustainability strategy and with choosing the most sustainable locations. And then, as I say, looking at the lack of adverse impact for the particular releases on the openness and purposes of the Greenbelt. So it was a very full and comprehensive study of not just the unmet, unmet need, but all the related factors which together justified uh, exceptional circumstances and together justified the headroom. So it's not surprising in those circumstances that all the claims were dismissed. Uh, if we look on the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so what can we draw more widely from the Compton judgment? Um, it's a very helpful uh, and comprehensive uh, discussion of the relevant legal principles and clarifies principles from the previous body of case law in this area. Um, <clears throat> one uh, key factor, of course, is, is what um, it, it are exceptional circumstances. Is that test a matter of law or planning judgment. And the parties in the Compton case agreed that whether a particular factor was capable of being an exceptional circumstance was a matter of law, and that was in line with the previous Gallagher Holmes case. But that what was a matter of, uh, what was a particular exceptional circumstance in any case was a matter of planning judgment. That was the agreed basis that the parties put forward their case. And in line with that, um, would be the Calverton decision, the Calverton Parish Council decision, where the court had decided as a matter of law that unmet need of itself is not sufficient to qualify as an exceptional circumstance. But Sir Dun Duncan Usley didn't really like that approach. He stepped back from that type of analysis and considered that um, the judicial body should be careful from over-analyzing the judicial emphasis should be on the rationality of the judgment rather than a definition or drawing criteria or characteristics for what constitutes exceptional circumstances uh, in, in circumstances where the policy makers have deliberately left that term um, broadly. Um, so 
there's very little scope left for um, bringing a, a legal challenge on the basis that a, any particular factor should not be an exceptional circumstance. The, um, so Duncan Newsley has very much left it in the broad terms of planning judgment for that to be decided, uh, subject of course to rationality challenge. He also looked at the comparison between the exceptional circumstances test uh, and the uh, development control test of very special circumstances. Um, and he said that as, as a matter of language, uh, it's clear that exceptional circumstances is less demanding than very special. I, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that as a matter of language, but it's very clear now that there is uh, established authority that the exceptional circumstances test is less demanding and is less uh, of a high hurdle than the very special circumstances test. He confirmed um, that there's no last resort requirement uh, in terms of, uh, of exceptional circumstances. So um, it's not necessary to, uh, as a matter of law, to go through everything else before you can say that exceptional circumstances exist. But of course, you need to bear in mind uh, the policy test, which I referred to earlier in, pay, in paragraph 137 of the MPPF, which does require the consideration of alternatives for meeting the need with specific examples set out there. And of course, there's also the uh, SEA requirement to consider alternatives in local plan strategies. Um, there's no falsification test. Now that means uh, that there used to be some arguments that uh, Greenbelt land could only be removed um, from Greenbelt status where it was established that the assumptions on which the Greenbelt had originally been established had become flawed or had become uh, uh, undermined by later circumstances. There's no reason uh, or, or, or basis for that requirement and that, that, that is not necessary to remove land from the Greenbelt. He uh, debunked this idea that normal cannot be exceptional uh, and expressly stated that exceptional is not restricted to matters unlikely to recur in similar fashion elsewhere. And he expressly, expressly uh, addressed the issue of um, the policy on stage assessment, i.e. whether um, the objectively assessed need uh, cannot, ca can be justified as not being met because of Greenbelt. He said that that doesn't need to be considered ex uh, separately. Um, it, it's necessarily an, a part and parcel of the exceptional circumstances test and doesn't need to be an additional hurdle, albeit that the inspector in the Guildford case did in fact consider it separately and addressed it uh, comprehensively. Um, so that was uh, the, uh, the conclusion uh, of, of Compton and it leaves open uh, very wide discretion and a uh, broad area of judgment for decision makers to um, take land from the green belt uh, and as long as they give reasons which are rational there is pretty much um, a, an open discretion which will not be interfered with by a, a court on a, a statutory challenge. Um, so that's the uh, conclusion in Compton. I should just mention if we can go to the next slide please Josh. Uh, there is another case on uh, on these issues, which uh, was heard in February before Mrs Justice Leaven, Airborough Air Neighbourhood Development Forum against Leeds City Council. Uh, it was a challenge to the Leeds site allocations plan, which was adopted last summer. And it raises similar issues relating to uh, what are exceptional circumstances, whether they um, were addressed properly by the inspectors, whether there was a proper consideration of alternatives and whether the headroom above the need was adequately justified, but not just adequately justified, whether it was adequately understood by the inspectors when they were making their decision. Um, it, judgment is awaited in that case uh, and so it's worth watching that space. And I'll now um, hand over to Matt, who is going to deal with exceptional circumstances on the ground and how inspectors have specifically considered that in relation to different uh, examination reports. So Matt. Thank you very much. Um, I, yes, I'm going to be dealing with housing need uh, within a Greenbelt authorities area. Um, I hope that I'll be able to now move on to the next, there we are. Yes, I'll be dealing with, um, as I say, housing need in a Greenbelt authorities area. 
Now, how can uh, an authority meet its AON require requirements in a plan making context? Well, it can provide for it outside of the green belt. It can provide for uh, the need in another authority's area in order to avoid or minimize green belt release. Uh, it can obviously provide for it through the removal of land from the green belt, or it can not release the green belt land and not provide uh, for the objectively assessed need. Now, those approaches uh, lead to a number of issues. And they're the issues that I'm going to be dealing with. The first of which uh, is whether when one is looking at removing land from the green belt, is housing need sufficient of itself uh, to justify uh, the removal? Uh, of course, Jenny has dealt with that in some, uh, uh, some to some extent, some, um, yeah, and has dealt with it clearly. Uh, I'll address one particular matter arising from both the Calverton and the Compton cases, uh, which we'll deal with shortly. The second uh, issue is how have inspectors justified the removal of land from the Greenbelt? What has their position been in respect of housing need? Uh, in practice, has housing need alone been sufficient? I'll also deal with the two-stage process of justification, which one can see in the uh, examining inspectors reports. The third area uh, concerns what other factors can be used to justify changes to Greenbelt boundaries. And uh, I focus on one particular matter, namely the sustainable locations for development as a justification for um, removing land from the Greenbelt. Uh, the fourth issue concerns the DTC and the use of another authority's land in order to uh, make up the shortfall in the OAN provision. The fifth I'll deal with is the use of neighbourhood plans as a way of making substantial boundary changes, uh, which will um, uh, give a cameo appearance, I think, for Rob uh, when uh, I deal with that. The sixth issue concerns uh, not meeting the uh, OAN uh, and the ramifications of doing so. So if we go on uh, to deal with the first of those points, removing land from the Greenbelt is housing need alone sufficient. Now the Calverton decision um, said that objectively assessed housing need of itself could not logically be sufficient to amount to exceptional circumstances for plan change. Now I have to say, uh, I um, disagree or, or I have always really disagreed with that approach because what it fails to acknowledge is that there may be material changes of circumstances that come along um, to justify uh, a removal of land from the Greenbelt for housing need purposes, even though the Greenbelt itself has been put in place to protect against such development. And that, that latter point is the reason, uh, reasoning behind Calverton um, as to the circularity or the lack of logicality behind um, uh, allowing for housing need to be provided um, uh, by way of exceptional circumstances um, to change the Greenbelt boundary. And it, it's interesting in Compton, uh, when one reads it, that it accepted, or Sir Duncan Woosley accepted, uh, that need of itself could be sufficient. Uh, what he said is that its uh, position is it is simply not necessarily sufficient of itself uh, to justify uh, an amendment to the boundary, i.e. it may be sufficient depending upon the circumstances. So that was the approach taken in Compton as a matter of theory. But of course, one needs to look at the reality of what the situation is. And the reality requires one to go on to paragraphs 137 to 138 uh, and to justify uh, a, an amendment of the boundary um, uh, by way uh, of consideration of a number of different factors. The, again, Jenny's dealt with these, but the use of brownfield land, looking to increase the density of urban areas, the use of DTC discussions, all of which were highlighted in Compton, all of which were really found their genesis in uh, Calverton. Um, but you have to satisfy those. And if you don't satisfy those, then uh, the reality is that there won't be uh, a finding on the part of an examining inspector that you accord with the NPPF's uh, policies. Uh, and as a result of that, it wouldn't be a sound approach uh, that had been taken. Now, um, uh, what that means, of course, is that whatever one might look at by way of the law, one really has to come back to the practicality of what is required by the NPPF. And one can see that when one's looking at the position in practice. And so if one is um, considering, say, uh, the Cheshire East in, Inspector in 2017, uh, and of course an early decision in terms of the most recent cases, 
But uh, that inspector found uh, that there wasn't an exceptional case for releasing land to meet the housing need, uh, affordable housing, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, but that had to be combined and was combined with the adverse consequences for patterns of sustainable development of not taking that approach. Note that point about sustainable development. Uh, and as well as the lack of alternative options to releasing green belt land. Similar position can be found in Green, uh, in Guildford, a similar position can be found uh, in East Hearts. Note again, in terms of East Hearts, the position was that one of the factors beyond the housing need was uh, because of the, the locality in question and the lack of access within uh, the areas outside of the green belt to services and facilities and sustainable transport modes, um, it was going to be more sustainable to develop within the green belt than not. Um, so, um, so bear uh, that point in mind for the purposes of another issue I raise later on. Can everybody hear me? Because if everybody can hear me, then I'm going to carry on using uh, the um, using my own slides, which is. Uh, going to be necessary, I think, because uh, at the moment I can't move uh, the screen through. Uh, yeah, carry so, on, carry on, Matt. That's absolutely fine. Thank you very much. So, what you'll see anyway when we come to look uh, at um, the various screen, uh, the, the various uh, slides that should come up. Um, uh, is that um, in both Barnsley, Wickham, New Forest and in Cambridge, there was a combination of various factors that had to be taken into account in order to justify the position with regard to uh, uh, the release of land from the Greenbelt. The... the next issue that I said that I would go on to is the um, uh, sustainable locations for development. Uh, the um, provision, as I say, of sustainable forms of development as a factor in justifying release from the green belt is something that can be taken into account. See um, Power 138 of the MPPF, but in reality it's been regarded as something secondary to the release of uh, land for the purposes of uh, providing for uh, housing need. And so one, if one sees the wire examination, if one sees the Sunderland case, uh, if one sees the East Hearts um, case, uh, I can see that we are now up. Josh, can you move on please one slide? Uh, the East Hearts examination, the lack of sustainability that would occur if what one was doing was concentrating development within uh, non-green belt areas, um, was a factor to be taken into account when justifying a release. Uh, so that was the position um, uh, with regard to uh, the sustainable locations point. So going on, as I said, we would deal with the two-stage approaches of in inspectors in their examinations. The two-stage approach can be seen in South Cam's uh, examination report, in the Barnsley inspectors report and in the Wickham um, uh, report. And what one finds in this two-stage approach is a general justification for except for the release of land from the green belt on basic exceptional circumstances, followed by specific justification in relation to specific narrow uh, and um, uh, localised areas. And in those, in turn, dealing with uh, the localised areas, um, it's there that one sees consideration of visual issues, openness, and the taking into account of the purposes of the particular area of land's uh, 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 purpose in, in terms of green belt uh, protection. So the DTC, um, the DTC of course needs to be taken into account, see para 137 of the MPPF, C section 33A of the 2004 Act. A good example of that that one can see in practice is the position in Hart, Hart's taking Surrey Heath Borough Council's land in part, or need in part, even though Surrey Heath's plan has not yet been adopted, it's still at the preferred option stage. Guildford is another example, uh, taking Woking's unmet need, as Jenny has said, uh, as well as Waverley uh, taking some of uh, uh, Woking's need. So going on then to the use of neighbourhood plans to make substantial amendments to the Greenbelt boundary. 
Uh, Josh, you'll have to move on um, a couple of, uh, again, if you can move on one more, please, thanks. Uh, the use of um, neighbourhood plans to make substantial amendments to the Greenbelt boundary was attempted in one of Rob Alton's cases, the Burston Garden Centre uh, case by a parish council who said uh, well, we can make um, uh, a, an allocation within our neighbourhood plan, the effect of which would be to remove that land from the Greenbelt. But of course that can't happen. An independent examiner has to decide whether or not um, a particular um, uh, uh, a proposal within a neighbourhood plan is in accordance with the MPPF. Uh, the MPPF says you can't make um, more than detailed changes um, uh, to Greenbelt boundaries by way of the neighbourhood plan. The justification for the release has to be in the MP it has to be in the local plan itself. Um, that will set out the pattern and scale of development. Um, so uh, whilst it was tried in that case, um, it's not something that could be successfully done. The inspector had concerns about it, but didn't raise a conclusive point. I think it is concluded, conclusive. So lastly then, um, authorities not meeting the ON. Unsurprisingly, not many are doing that. And the reason they're not doing it, and I think it's an important point, the reason they're not doing it is because of the change between what was the test in the MPPF 2012 and what is the test now in the 2019 MPPF. As Jenny has said, what one needs now is to establish that there's a strong reason on the basis of the Greenbelt policies within the MPPF for not meeting the need as opposed to the old 2012 uh, test, which is that the various policies were not, um, the various policies could be relied on if they indicated that um, need should not be met. So now a strong reason. As a result, not many authorities are adopting an approach of not meeting the AOM. Surrey Heath is one of them. As I say, it's a preferred option stage. Uh, and we'll wait to see whether or not that is endorsed by an inspector. Um, uh, on the basis of what uh, one sees by way of the policy, that may well be an uphill struggle. So there we are. Um, forgive me for the, um, the difficulties with the slides, but of course you'll have those slides. Um, I'll turn, o turn on, or rather provide the floor to uh, Matthew Dale Harris, who's going to deal with the situation indeed, if you don't meet your AON through the plan process, that's to say very special circumstances. So uh, over to you, Matt. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, Yes, thank you everybody. Good morning. Um, I'm, for this talk, I'm going to be taking you through a roundup of some of the recent planning appeals dealing with very special circumstances test. Um, when I was originally thinking about how to, how to sort out this talk, I thought I might range fairly widely over the, um, the, re the recent appeals, but having done my research, I can tell you that there are over 75 appeals that have uh, dealt with the VSC question um, in, um, in the, since the beginning of 2019. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I can't click on to my next slide. Oh, there we are. Just give me a second. There, there's been over, over 75 of which 41 appeals were allowed. So in order to make it a bit more manageable within my, my 10 minute time slot, what I'm going to do is take a two-pronged attack and firstly I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the biggest categories of cases which have succeeded um, at meeting the VSC test and then I'm going to go through a bit of a more detailed discussion on the three most recent recovered appeals um, which I've listed there at the bottom of the slide um, and you'll find when you go back to the slides that there are hyperlinks um, which will take you through to the relevant um, decisions of the Secretary of State. So, first of all, the three bigger categories. Now, I'm conscious we're running a little bit behind our time, so I'll deal with this quite briefly. Um, the biggest category by far, it relates to specialist need cases. So, um, particularly travellers cases, um, where 12 of the 41 successful appeals um, lie. Um, those cases obviously have the common backdrop of a long-term failure um, in Greenbelt authorities to plan for a sufficient number of sites, um, combined with the statutory duty under the, um, under the public sector equality duty um, to have regards to the need to eliminate discrimination and the strong guidance set out in the planning policy for travellers sites um, in 2015. And in reality, there are a number of authorities which are 
effectively planning for but through appeal um, when it comes to travellers. Um, there's also a few um, rural worker exception um, schemes which have come through. Um, they generally turn on compliance with paragraph 79A, um, which is the specific, specific provision dealing with that form of exceptional size. Um, I've also then identified infrastructure projects, most notably the fairly recent DCO decision for the West Midlands um, SFRI. Um, again, perhaps not surprising that a large infrastructure project like that can meet the VSC test once it's got through all the challenges of complying with, um, with the relevant national policy statement. Um, the national and regional um, need case in that context was held to outweigh the harm um, to the Greenbelt. Um, community and social benefit cases are perhaps a little more, more interesting and a bit more relevant um, for those of you who are seeking to bring forward schemes, new schemes for development of the Greenbelt. Um, there are cases like the West Drayton one where um, particular school facilities have been held um, to meet the VSC need. Stanley Road case, again, another school which we're going to come to consider in a bit more detail in a moment. And then there are also cases like the, the various extra care unit um, schemes that have come through, particularly the Whitchurch Road scheme last year, where the inspectors have given substantial weight as part of the VSC case to socioeconomic benefits which shade into community benefits. So in, in Whitchurch Road, the inspector said that the units would relieve pressure on local community and health facilities, and he gave that substantial weight. Now turning to our, our three recovered appeals, which I hope are going to give us um, a bit of an insight into the current thinking of the Secretary of State. Um, and we have a, a very current decision to start off with, um, it was published just yesterday, and it relates to a scheme um, up in the York Greenbelt at Moore Lane. Um, this was dismissed, but I think when we look at the way it was addressed by the Secretary of State and the inspector, there are a number of points which I think are going to be of particular interest um, for those looking to bring forward housing, particularly when we're dealing with areas of particular need where there are there's a history of constraints. Um, as will be familiar, I think, with everybody, um, York is a highly constrained market. Um, it hasn't had a development plan adopted since 1956. Um, and this proposal of 516 residential units um, was, was substantial in the scope, in the scale of, in the scope of York. Um, and also, quite importantly, proposed a high level of affordable housing, 35%, when compared with the policy requirement of 30%. Now, the inspector and Secretary of State gave considerable weight to housing. Um, always a bit of a question of inference, what considerable means. Um, but I think of the, uh, the point which I would particularly draw your attention to is that the moderate excess affordable housing, so the 5% above the 30%, um, the inspector said that should be given disproportionate value as part of the very special circumstances case. And he took that together with the broader housing benefits to say that he drew that together to say that in his view it might be thought that those cumulative benefits would clearly outweigh the Greenbelt harm which was substantial if not overwhelming and the landscape of visual impact harm. Now as, you, as the quote I've, I've outlined there makes clear that was a conditional um, conclusion if it might be thought that those benefits would clearly outweigh if they were the only adverse considerations. But unfortunately, um, in the particular context of Moore Lane, the VSC test wasn't met because there was a local triple SI, the Ascombe Bog triple SI, and the conclusion of the inspector was that the housing, by effectively drying out the water flow that was going into the bog, um, the, the, the scheme would both harm the triple SI and also, I think particularly importantly, would cause the loss of an irreplaceable habitat. So the tests under 175 B and C weren't met in that case, henceforth no VSC. 
I've also just highlighted one point there, which um, in terms of approach, the inspector appears to have very much focused on the idea that to become part of a VSC case, a benefit needs to be in some way disproportionate because he appears at paragraph 350 to draw a distinction between the benefits which are going to go into the general planning balance and the benefits which are going to go into, um, into the specific VSC evaluation. Now, the Secretary of State is clearly not so sure, and in his decision letter, he, he hedges it, I think, almost certainly in order to make sure that he was protected from legal challenge. But I think a useful point when, um, when authorities and, um, and applicants are seeking to, to fight out uh, the VSC case, that, that might be a useful indication of, of approach. Next case goes back just a little bit earlier in the year, um, to the 23rd of April, and this relates to the redevelopment of the Wheatley campus at Oxford Brooks. Um, this was a pretty much a pure housing scheme, 500 odd units, including 173 affordable housing units. And the broader context, um, again, probably reasonably familiar, was of an emerging plan, um, South Oxfordshire emerging plan, which, as I think many will know, has experienced significant challenges um, and is, is rather delayed. Um, but an emerging plan which proposed release of this site from the Greenbelt. So the Secretary of State gives it limited weight, but you still feel that that must be a, a, an important factor in the background. I think str the striking aspect of the case was that the local authority in this situation could in fact establish a five years housing land supply, um, although it accepted an acute shortage of affordable housing. There are some points of detail which are important. Um, only 14% of the, of the proposal was um, was considered to be inappropriate because there was previously development land and also an area where there wasn't going to be built form. Um, and the proposal had an additional benefit through the removal of the 12-storey tower, which um, was agreed by all the parties to be a visual benefit to openness, the removal that is. So the decision, very special circumstances were made out and I think most strikingly, the Secretary of State gave very substantial weight to housing, particularly in the light of the affordable housing shortfall. Of course, he had to because in order to give very substantial weight to the housing, it was he wasn't in a position where he could point to immediate housing need because there was five years of housing land supply. Um, he gave very substantial weight to the benefits of removing the tower and then also significant weight to economic benefits, heritage benefits, and perhaps tying back to the community benefit idea from previous slides, he also gave significant weight to reinvestments of the proceeds in the education sector because effectively the receipts were going back to Oxford Brooks. Final case, got Stanley Road decision up in Stockport um, a day before, we're still not long into the past, just showing how thick the flurry, current flurry is. Um, this was a um, a redevelopment of a special educational needs school, which was cross-funded by 325 houses also in the Greenbelt. So a little bit different to the context of, of, of the Oxford Brooks case. Um, again, though, similarly, we had the context of the Greater Manchester Spatial Framework, which proposes release, but is at an early stage and has various um, difficulties. So again, Secretary of State gives it limited weight, but you feel that it must be part of the context, or at least the evidence documents under, under, underlying that policy must have played a, a major role. Um, in the decision, the real focus of the work was the Secretary of State's analysis and the inspector's analysis of the detail of the school's proposal. Um, could it be said that the transformation project went beyond what was necessary, though it couldn't? Could it be said that the anticipated cost wasn't justified or that there was another opportunity to cross fund? No, it couldn't. On those bases, both the inspector and the Secretary of State gave the school element its benefits to the special educational students who were going to, um, going to, um, going to use it, substantial weight. But he also gave very significant weight to the housing benefits and that was in the more traditional context of a shortfall in housing, housing land supply and a good offer of affordable housing, although it wasn't fully 
um, policy compliant. So moderate benefits, weight given to economic benefits and community facilities, but less of a feature than in the other appeal decisions. So drawing those together, I'm just trying to get to my final slide. Um, a few takeaway points. Um, it seems to me that the Secretary of State, through these recent decisions, has indicated that he's willing to give very substantial, considerable weight to housing as part of the balance, even when a five-year housing land supply is present. Um, however, that will be particularly where there is some aspect of acute need. And in that respect, the affordable housing, I think, is going to be something that lots of developers are going to want to look at carefully. Um, and that we'll also want to consider whether there is a scope for making a policy plus offer um, given the inspector's decision in Moore Lane. Um, there's also the, the point about disproportionate benefits um, and what, what goes into the VSC case. Um, and then as a general point, um, for developers also think about whether you can show some community benefit as in those decisions. Now that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, and I'll be passing on to John Lesson, who's talking about the Samuel Smith Supreme Court case and weighing the impact on openness. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, all. Um, <clears throat> I should apologise, really, in terms of the reference to Samuel Smith um, <clears throat> and to say exactly which case it was, because Samuel Smith are the self-appointed guardians of all things planning in in North Yorkshire uh, and I think the most recent uh, Samuel Smith case is one of about half a dozen in the last uh, 10 years. <laughs> um, the case that I'm talking about is the most recent uh, February 2020 decision by the Supreme Court and um, relates to um, the development of a magnesium limestone quarry uh, in the Greenbelt. Um, the facts very briefly well, that North Yorkshire County Council as the Mineral Authority granted planning permission for the extension of an existing limestone quarry in the Greenbelt. The officer's report contained a section on the landscape impacts and the impact on the Greenbelt in which she posed two particular questions. First question, would the development preserve the openness of the Greenbelt? Second question, would it conflict with the purposes of including land in the Greenbelt? The answers to both of those questions were to question one, yes, and to question two, no. Undoubtedly, the development had a visual impact, but it would not, uh, so the officer uh, concluded, materially harm the character and openness of the Greenbelt, and therefore it complied with the relevant Greenbelt policies, both in the local plan and indeed the NPPF. Um, <clears throat> Now, in terms of uh, Greenbelt policy, Lord Carnworth, who gave the, the judgment of the court, uh, ha ha reviewed Greenbelt policy since its inception back in the 1950s and traced it through from circular 42 or 55 PPG2 to uh, the 2018 version of the MPPF, which uh, the court was then considering, now updated to the 2019 version. Uh, and what he derived from that analysis of Greenbelt policy over the last 70 years was that the fundamental aim is to prevent urban sprawl by keeping land permanently open uh, and that the essential characteristic of Greenbelt is its openness and its permanence. Uh, he identified that the five purposes of including land in the Greenbelt, which are set out on the slide, uh, and which uh, <coughs> were included back in the 1950s had uh, had, had continued to uh, be current uh, and <coughs> um, were those that um, were, sorry, the, the purposes remained the same as they always had been. Uh, and what he drew from that was that whilst the fundamental aim uh, and the purposes of the Greenbelt was that visual quality of the landscape is not in itself an essential part of openness. So what does openness actually mean? Um, <clears throat> there have been various attempts by the courts to define that. Um, what Lord Carnworth said was that it's a broad policy concept. 
Uh, and as I say, the courts have variously divined it over, over the years uh, as unbuilt on land or the state of being free from built development. Uh, uh, the, the, the critical element is that it's the absence of buildings as distinct from the absence of visual impact. Uh, and Lord Calmuth said that it was clearly related to the fundamental aim of preventing urban sprawl and keeping land permanently open. Uh, and it was not necessarily a statement about the visual qualities of the land. Indeed, that it will resonate with, <coughs> with many people where um, Greenbelt, of course, is misunderstood. It's, it is possible for Greenbelt to have uh, visual uh, qualities, um, <coughs> but that is not its fundamental purpose. Um, and he gave as an example a large quarry, which might be very visually unattractive in the green belt, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it impacts on its openness. Indeed, he made the point that uh, a quarry uh, might act as a barrier to urban sprawl in a way which was no less effective than a stretch of agricultural land. Uh, and it seems to me that the counterpoint to, to the uh, point that Lord Carnwith was making is that new buildings, although they may have very limited impact, reduce openness. To my mind, it's crucial to understand the difference that the courts over the years have made between considerations which are mandatory in the sense that they must be taken into account and considerations which as a matter of discretion, a decision maker can take into account. And everyone will be familiar that the requirement in section 70 of the Town and Country Planning Act is to determine applications having regard to the development plan and any other material considerations without specifying what those other material considerations might be. And what the courts have made clear, and Lord Carnworth did again in the Samuel Smith case, was to say that there are two categories of considerations. Um, there is the category where the relevant statute requires expressly or impliedly a, a matter to be taken into account. And the example is the section 70 of the Town and Country Planning Act, which expressly requires the decision taker to take into account the development plan. Or another example would be section 66 of the List of Building Act, which again, mandates that the decision maker has to have regard and take into account the special uh, the desirability of preserving uh, listed uh, buildings. The second category of uh, considerations is where something is so obviously material that it would be irrational not to take it into account. So where for example planning policy says that a matter needs to be taken in account, into account it would be uh, foolish for the decision maker to not take it into account and is likely to result in an error of law. Now, how does that then relate to the uh, materiality of visual impact to openness? Um, well, where visual impacts uh, are expressly or impliedly identified in the act uh, or, or policy uh, considerations, which the decision taker has required to take into account uh, as a matter of legal obligation or because they are obviously material and that really was the question that Lord Carnworth said the Supreme Court had to answer. Could it be seen from the Act, could it be seen from the policy relating to green belts that visual impact was a matter which had to be taken to, into account or was so obviously material that it had to be taken into account and the answer was no. NPPF paragraph 90 of the 2018 version, now paragraph 146, does not expressly refer to visual impact as a necessary part of the analysis of whether mineral extraction would preserve the openness of the greenbelt or conflict with the purposes of including land in the greenbelt, nor on the facts of that particular case were the visual impacts obviously material to whether the proposed development uh, would affect the openness of the green belt. What, however, was material was that minerals can only be extracted where they are found, and that's what the uh, uh, the NPPF says. The temporary nature of the impacts themselves, and the fact that 
the extraction would be for a limited period of time and, and at the end of that there would be a requirement for restoration. But, and there's always a but, although visual impact was not a material uh, factor to openness in the Samuel Smith case, um, the Supreme Court was not saying that it is never relevant. It made it very clear that these are fact dependent and circumstances dependent, and it's a matter of planning judgment. Where visual impact is relevant to openness, then clearly, as is the case in relation to any uh, factor which is material, weight is a matter for the decision taker. Uh, and the last uh, point is, Visual impact is likely to be a material consideration to be weighed in the overall planning balance, even if it is not relevant to openness. So in the Samuel Smith case, uh, it was concluded that um, <clears throat> the visual impacts of the quarry were not relevant and did not impact on the openness point, but there were clearly visual impacts of the quarry on the landscape and they were taken into account in that planning balance. And with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Kate Olley, who is going to talk more about the exceptions subject to the openness proviso in what is now paragraph uh, 145, 146. Thank you, John. I've set out the text of paragraph 145 of the MPPF for reference, which is largely the same as uh, old paragraph 89 of the previous MPPF. And we see there the seven exceptions to the construction of new buildings in the Green Belt being regarded as inappropriate. So agricultural buildings, provision of facilities for outdoor sport and recreation, or cemeteries, burial grounds and allotments, extending or altering an existing building subject to proportionality, replacing a building as long as it isn't materially larger and is in the same use, limited infilling in villages, limited affordable housing in accordance with development plan policies, including for rural exception sites, and finally, limited infilling or partial or complete redevelopment of PDL, redundant or otherwise. And we note that uh, B and G are subject to the proviso of respectively preserving openness and not having a greater impact on openness than before. And the final words in G were a change from uh, the old paragraph 89, including adding a no substantial harm to openness test in the case of uh, reuse of previously developed land. Uh, the no revolutionary developments of late, but we have had a recent Court of Appeal judgment last month in relation to the uh, agricultural occupants, agricultural building exception. That's the case of Hook. Lord Justice Limblom started uh, his judgment in a now quite familiar way by saying that there was no new issue of law raised. Uh, and the case does turn on its facts. The issue was whether the inspector went wrong in finding that a dwelling wasn't a building for agriculture and therefore not an exception to inappropriate development. Uh, even though an agricultural occupancy condition had been put forward, but he did pull out some basic points from the relevant cases, including the recent Supreme Court decision in Sam Smith's. Josh, can you move the slide on for me, please? Thank you. Um, so the first is that uh, the green belt policy concepts such as inappropriate development, very special circumstances, preservation of the openness of the green belt and the impact of development on the purposes of including land within the green belt are not concepts of law, but broad concepts of planning policy to be used in a wide range of circumstances. And he reaffirmed that where there was a question of policy interpretation, the policy needs to be read sensibly in its context and not treated like a statutory provision. As for applying policy, that calls for realism and common sense. Next slide, please. 
secondly, to deal with a threshold question of whether a proposal is for inappropriate development in the Greenbelt and then deciding whether it's acceptable and should be given planning permission, the decision maker must establish the relevant facts and exercise their planning judgment. Uh, the court won't, in a public law challenge, go beyond its limited role and will only review the decision maker's application of policy on traditional public law grounds, avoiding excessive legalism, of course, and not second guessing the decision maker's findings of fact, unless there's been an obvious mistake. It won't interfere with a reasonable exercise of planning judgment, but will act, must act, if there's been a misinterpretation of policy affecting the exercise of planning judgment. Next slide, please. Thirdly, the nature of the decision maker's task will change depending on the kind of development proposed. So for agricultural buildings, paragraph 145A, uh, and it was still paragraph 89 at the time of the original decision in Hook, this will largely be a, a matter of fact, uh, and there's no proviso to apply in relation to preservation of openness. It's completely unqualified. As Lord Justice Limblom said in the Lee Valley case, all such buildings are in principle appropriate development in the Greenbelt, regardless of their effect on openness and the purposes of including land in the Greenbelt, and regardless of their size and location. Most of the other paragraph 145 categories, of course, are subject to some proviso, qualification or limit. I just mentioned here paragraph 146, providing for the six other forms of appropriate development in the Green Belt, which are all subject to the proviso of preserving openness and not conflicting with the purposes of inclusion. So by contrast, assessing whether a proposed facility for outdoor sport, which is paragraph 145b, would preserve the openness of the green belt is going to be largely a matter of planning judgment rather than fact. But that planning judgment will though turn on the particular facts and isn't predetermined by the general statement in what's now paragraph 133 MPPF that one of the essential characteristics of green belts is their openness. The word openness is open textured and a number of factors are capable of being relevant when it comes to applying it to the facts of a case. Next slide, please. In Hook, the inspector had disagreed that the development sought but was a building for agriculture, so therefore found that it wasn't appropriate development in the Green Belt, and he wasn't required to consider the imposition of an agricultural occupancy condition. He didn't have to take into account a proposed condition that was incompatible with the proposal uh, for him. Next slide, please. Thank you, Josh. Uh, there's been a recent rural exception site case, that's the Housing Plus Group decision. Uh, it proposed five houses and five bungalows to be located in an unused field within the Greenbelt, adjacent to the settlement boundary of a small settlement falling in the plan within the category of other villages and hamlets. And the scheme was proposed as a rural exception site with all of the dwellings being affordable and for occupation by local people. Next slide, please. So the appropriateness of the scheme in the Green Belt was a main issue in the appeal. Under the development plan, there were five criteria to be met in order for a site to be a rural exception site, and these were all satisfied. We can see in the note, uh, the, the, the large uh, uh, bulleted paragraph there, about the consideration of those five criteria, how the issue of the size and scale of the development and its relationship to existing services and facilities was dealt with. That's the third one round about in the middle there, if you can see. The settlement didn't have any services or facilities or any public transport, so future residents would need a car, uh, but it was close to a main service village and rural exception sites were by their nature found in places not normally considered suitable for housing. And the site was also sympathetic to the prevailing character of the area and although just outside the development boundary, it was surrounded by housing and other built development and wouldn't represent a significant incursion of the settlement into the open countryside. And next slide, please, Josh. Just a quick foray into para 146, given the similarities in terms of the key test of openness in para 146. As I've already mentioned, all of the para 146 categories are subject to that test of openness and no conflict. 
And it's worth reminding ourselves of what Mr Justice Oosley said in Europa Oil and Gas, that impact on openness is a matter of judgment, which will take into account the nature of what's proposed. There it was mineral extraction, but he gave the example of two buildings which, although materially similar, failed to be treated differently in terms of whether they would be appropriate. The green belt could be harmed by one, but not by the other. Last slide, please, Josh. Thank you. A recent example of the approach taken is the decision in Smithson Hill Limited's appeal in relation to an agri-tech park, uh, in which uh, Mr Walton QC acted, and I'm sure he'd be happy to answer any questions about the issues there. It was a decision in which the Secretary of State concluded that transport infrastructure, category C in paragraph 146, was not inappropriate development, even though there will be a substantial impact. And you can see there the balancing exercise that was undertaken, if I give you a moment to scan your eye down that. Although the transport infrastructure works would have an urbanising influence on the open countryside and to some extent conflict with the purpose of the Green Belt, it was not by reason of its nature and scale sufficient to exceed the power 146 threshold. So the local transport infrastructure exception uh, did apply there. Thank you very much. And next we will hear from our colleague, Nick Grant. Thank you very much. Ah, it works. Um, in light of what you've heard this afternoon uh, or this morning, it'll be entirely unsurprising, I think, to everyone on this call that the Green Belt is controversial. Uh, a quick Google will reveal a uh, lot of proposals for reform of the Green Belt or of keeping it as it is from all sections of the public and uh, the press. Um, the public generally seem fairly supportive of the Green Belt, even if they don't wholly understand it. Uh, the Natural England and CPRE report in 2010 said that, and the Nipsos Mori poll in 2015 bore that out as well. Um, perhaps also entirely unsurprisingly, support for the Green Belt was lowest amongst 25 to 34 year olds or those hoping one day to buy a house. That said, there's been a lot of pressure for reform from economic actors that suggest it's distorting markets, uh, leading to building in floodplains um, and that parts of the quality are parts of the Green Belt, sorry, are not high quality. The OECD has suggested in 2011, 2013, 2015, and most recently in 2017, uh, that the government's approach of developing small sites and increasing densities, densities won't address a housing shortage, um, and that a careful reassessment of the overall economic costs and benefits of the Green Belt needs to be undertaken. Um, a similar call for reassessment was recently made by the policy, by the think tank policy exchange in its rethinking the planning system for the 21st century, um, which some of you may well be familiar with. They advocate largely move to zoning. Um, and recently, concerns with the green belt and the effect it's having on the housing market have been thrown into sharp relief by flooding um, and the flooded, serious floods that we saw not that long ago, although given everything that happened since, it seems to be quite a while. Um, Sir John Armit, who's the chairman of the National Infrastructure Commission, gave an interview with The Times uh, in March, uh, stating that if councils are to avoid the quote unquote silly decisions to put houses on floodplains, then it opens up a difficult debate, but it's probably going to require building on the green belt. Um, in the same edition, uh, the Times ran an editorial that said judicial, judicious building on the green belt, frankly, is going to be necessary. But what are the options? Well, the first and most dramatic that's been put forward is the complete abolition of the green belt. This is a long-standing argument from the Adam Smith Institute uh, put forward in uh, the paper The Green Noose in 2015. Um, and although policy exchange don't explicitly state in their proposal for reform that the Green Belt needs abolishing, they spend a lot of time going through the proposed weaknesses with it um, and trying to dispel the arguments against keeping it, or arguments in favour of keeping it, sorry. So I would be surprised if that's something that, that wasn't backed, although as I say, it wasn't explicitly said so. Um, that also seems to be the view of at least a few people who are asking questions on this thread. The second option is to remove green belt designations from areas around railway stations. This was a uh, short term alternative 
proposed by the Adam Smith Institute in the Green Noose. Uh, they say that removing restrictions on land within a 10 minute walk from a railway station could lead to a million more homes uh, in the green belt surrounding London. More recently, in the Centre for Cities, or the Centre for Cities published a report from academics from the UCL and the LSE uh, called Homes on the Right Tracks, which had broadly similar conclusions. They suggest releasing land for development um, within 800 metres of any station that has a service of 45 minutes to a major city, and again suggest that could lead to building up to 2.1 million homes, roughly half of which in London. Um, it seems implicit in both of these reports and others that make similar recommendations that by releasing land within railway stations, it will lead to more use of that public transport. And so I put in the RTPI 2015 paper that tries that, that, that challenges that assumption um, and suggests that actually a lot of the commuters rather than commuting by rail will still do so by car. Um, they suggest, in fact, that the one, a, a proposal similar to that put forward in the Green Noose uh, could lead to between 3.96 million and 7.45 million additional car uses uh, in London, although that uses data that's almost a decade old. The third potential uh, is to largely keep the green belt, but focus on making it usefully beneficial to those living in cities. This was put forward most recently uh, in a paper for the Labour Party in 2019 by George Monbiot and others. Um, this is just prioritising it for community food growing and access to land purposes rather than uh, making any substantive changes. But what is the government's response? Oh, too far. Um, it's been a fairly consistent line up until very, very recently that it's focusing on brownfield sites and infill development. That was its response to the OECD. Um, it's largely the response in the NPPF 2019. Um, and any time that a press release comes out, there's usually something in there about supporting the green belt. The eight million pound cash boost for vibrant new communities, for example, contains a line saying, um, it built on the government's commitment to giving communities a voice, including prioritizing local brownfield land while protecting the green belt. Uh, I've picked out a couple of Esther McVeigh speeches uh, as recently as the back end of last year. Um, her speech to Nippon said, let me be clear, Increasing the supply of affordable homes does not mean tearing up the green belt. Um, and on the NPPF, she said, I want to be clear, our commitment to this, the green belt, is as strong as ever. But very, very recently, there might be some indications that the government is starting to at least consider uh, building on the green belt to be necessary. It's all very softly, softly at the moment, but Robert Jenrick, in, his spe in a speech made in the 27th of February, uh, said that councils and communities are going to face difficult choices to counter the housing shortage and that will include building on the green belt. Um, planning for the future, which was a document that came out uh, last month, doesn't expressly mention the green belt, although there's reference to an upcoming white paper, so we'll see what that brings. Um, but in the parliamentary debates, uh, it was put, the question was put again to Robert Jenrick, um, and he said, well, we, we absolutely want to have a brownfield first policy, but, and he made a couple of other points, but at the end, we have to balance that with ensuring that homes are available for the next generation in those parts of the country where people really want to live. There's also a reference in that paper to uh, reviewing the policy for building in areas of flood risk. So to the extent that there is a trade-off between building in the green belt or building on floodplains, again, I think that's starting to be uh, thrown into rather sharp relief. So again, softly, softly, no clear policy change at the moment, but um, there is at least some suggestion that the government is starting to consider that uh, a viable alternative. That said, the only piece of legislation on this at the moment is the Green Belt Protection Bill. Uh, this is a private member's bill, so it's not a government bill, um, but it in fact goes the other way and increases protection for the Green Belt. It creates a national register of Green Belt land restricts the ability of local authorities to de-designate Greenbelt land and says that they, local authorities couldn't grant planning permission on development on former Greenbelt land if it's for housing at a greater density than any housing adjoining or contiguous to it. This is at an, a very early stage, um, it's just had its first reading in the Commons and because it's a private member's bill it can be filibustered out. Uh, it was introduced by Christopher Chope who some of you may or may not be familiar with has himself uh, filibustered a few some high profile bills in the last few years. So we'll see how far it goes. That is, I think, 
it from me. Um, so I'll hand over back to our esteemed chair who will run the Q&A session. Lovely esteemed, but thank you very much indeed, uh, Nick. And we are running slightly over time. So what we've decided to do uh, is for each of our speakers um, to uh, take one of the questions uh, which, has, uh, which have come in. Uh, thank you for all of them. We're not gonna be able to go through them all. Um, uh, I will pass those straight on to Jenny uh, and uh, we'll do it in speaker order, picking out questions and giving our answers. Thanks Rob and I'm very glad to see that the whole screen hasn't expl exploded when I start to uh, join so uh, fingers crossed it won't. Um, yes first question I the question I was going to deal with um, is one about Greenbelt release um, is often it says it's often discarded at the initial SEA options sift stage without weighing the Calverton cost benefits and NN NPPF 138 type sustainability factors. The relative sustainability benefits of Greenbelt Relief are therefore ignored in SEA assessment. Is that lawful? Um, well, uh, the short and loyally answer to that is it can be, I'm afraid, it can be lawful. And that's because the identification of reasonable alternatives uh, in an SEA process is a matter for evaluative judgment of the local planning authority. And so as long as that judgment is rational, um, then it's not subject to legal, uh, it wouldn't be subject to a successful legal challenge. <clears throat> Having said that, the reasonableness um, of uh, alternatives has to be informed by the objectives sought to be achieved by the particular strategy, and that's, uh, that, that, that's a particular case, the Cornwall RLT built development case. And the local planning authority does have to at least uh, uh, put its mind to the question of reasonable alternatives in that context and if alternatives are in fact considered in in some sort of if you can dig and find some report where an alternative has in fact been considered but then not been subject to SEA process that could be unlawful so if 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 for example a local planning authority is weighing up a sustainable strategy of um, distributing development across the district but then says oh we have to change that or amend that because of all the green belts and then uh, has thought well we could we could think about re releasing green belt oh no let's not bother and then has uh, so, so has potentially you could argue potentially has considered it as a reasonable alternative but discarded it um, arguably you could challenge that on the basis that that should have then been included in the SEA assessment because it was a potential reasonable alternative to the strategy that was sought to be pursued in the context of the objectives that were being um, followed. Uh, so uh, no clear-cut answer I'm afraid because this is all planning judgment but there are potential ways in for a legal challenge um, if uh, a strategy hasn't been uh, taken into account and properly pursued through the SEA process. I think that's I think that answers that question as far as I can for now Rob. Yeah thank you and so, so is it Matt next? <clears throat> yes thanks Rob thanks I'm going to deal with a question that addresses the um, the, the lack of uh, enthusiasm on the part of authorities to identify safeguarded land uh, which is set out within power 139 of the MPPF uh, and that lack of enthusiasm is something um, the question is asked uh, that should uh, be overturned and that there ought to be a greater um, uh, greater direction on the part of local plan inspectors to re require uh, that safeguarded land uh, to be uh, uh, set out within the plan. And my experience of the position is um, one that follows that which has been asked by the um, questioner. Uh, that um, the safeguarded land provisions, whilst they exist within the MPPF, don't seem to be um, uh, being uh, adopted uh, on a consistent basis by uh, local authorities when it comes to the provision, uh, provision that they need to make within their plans. Of course, the problem is that 139 um, sets out at sub C that it's only where necessary that they should, uh, let's say authorities, identify uh, the safeguarded land. So there's always a get out uh, and that get out is one uh, that uh, enables them not to have to go through that process. I'd say it's a process of course that one can understand in terms of local authorities because they're doing their best uh, to try to meet their OAN uh, um, uh, within uh, the confines of their district which often involves um, releasing greenbelt land. So there's um, uh, 
uh, a, uh, there's an imperative, at least on the face of it, set out in 139, but it is conditional and one that can be then set aside. So whilst inspectors could potentially need to uh, take that approach, um, I don't think that one is going to uh, be seeing that set out as a reason for finding a plan unsound um, in the near future. So that's my answer. Um, uh, I'll pass on to Matt Dale Harris, uh, who will no doubt answer another question. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, I'm going to pick up a, on a question which um, referred to a topic which I think possibly hasn't been mentioned during the seminar, which is the consequences of COVID-19. Um, the question was whether or not um, I think that economic benefits are going to play a particular role going forwards in the establishment of very special circumstances cases. Um, and I, I mean, my personal view is, is absolutely, um, I think it's, it, it must be right um, that in a time of the economic crisis, economic benefits are particularly valuable. Um, and I'll, I'll just take the opportunity just to flag up a, what's hopefully a, 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 a assumed to be seen decision um, which is a call-in case um, that I was, I was involved in with for, um, for Bolton Council. And it's a scheme up in, um, up in up Bolton, and it involves a redevelopment of a registered park and garden to provide a, a golf course, which is aimed at winning the Ryder Cup or getting the Ryder Cup to come to the Northwest. And it's got about a thousand homes of enabling development or cross-funding development in the Greenbelt. So I think that might be a very interesting, that, that's sitting with the Secretary of State at the moment, it might be quite an interesting case for telling us how serious the Secretary of State is about economic benefit, because economic benefit was absolutely at the heart of the case that the applicant, um, Peel, in that case, was, was making and that Bolton Council was supporting. So um, watch this space is my, uh, my comment for that one. Um, next, uh, next up, I think we've got John. Thank you, Matt. Um, yes, I'm going to respond to the question uh, where someone expressed the view that they disagreed that views are a factor in uh, respect of a green belt's openness. Uh, and they give us an example, there may be topographical features or dense woodland in a green belt, which preclude views across wide tracts of it, yet they do not affect the green belt's openness as defined. Uh, if I've understood that question right, I, I, then um, the disagreement that views are a factor is the one that was expressed by the Supreme Court because in that case the challenge by Samuel Smith was <laughs> that the planning officer was bound to take into account the visual impact of the proposed extension to the quarry in determining whether or not the openness was compromised and of course the, court, the Supreme Court said that in that particular case it wasn't um, necessary to take into account the visual impacts in determining that the openness would be preserved. So um, <clears throat> I think you, you, you and the Supreme Court are, are, are lockstep. What I would say though is that um, merely because you can't see development because it's going to be screened by dense woodland or, or the like does not mean that it doesn't affect openness. Indeed the point that the court made in the Lee Valley case, Keith Limblom, was that um, it is the absence of development. Um, so if you have new buildings that take up part of the green belt, the mere fact that you can't see it doesn't mean that it's not going to compromise the openness of the, of the green belt. I think what I would other, also say is that it's not binary, and that's what the, the Supreme Court has made very clear. Um, <clears throat> in Samuel Smith's case, it wasn't necessary to take into account visual impact in determining openness of green belt, but that's not a rule of law. It was uh, a matter of discretion in the Samuel Smith case. There may well be other cases where the visual impact does go to whether or not openness is compromised. Thank you. And I think then Kate might be answering a question. Yeah. Oh, thank you, John. Um, yes, I had a question about whether in the context of paragraph 145B, facilities for outdoor recreation uh, sport, it, uh, a development would be inappropriate if there was to be 
a roof on a building where there wasn't previously, to which I would say not as a matter of principle, it will be a matter of planning judgment as usual. Thank you. And then finally, Nick, I think. Um, so I've basically been asked uh, several times the million dollar question, which is, is the government going to scrap Greenbelt? Um, in short, the arguments in doing it in favour of the moment are stronger than they've been for a while. Concerns about flooding, which I've already highlighted. The idea that housing in particular is somewhere not just that uh, we eat and sleep, but now somewhere that we might be confined for months at a time. Um, certainly be, should certainly be throwing the housing crisis into rather sharp relief. Um, but as I said, um, government policy so far doesn't particularly seem inclined to change. Um, Generic has come out with some hints, but again, at the same time, is saying things like we're pushing urban development into uh, away from ruinous country, uh, sorry, away from the ruination of the countryside. So we're not seeing any uh, drastic changes or drastic indicators. So uh, in the short term, I don't think so, but it's certainly a stronger argument now than it has been for a very long time. Thanks, Nick, and uh, thanks uh, uh, everyone. So. That brings us uh, to the end of the webinar. Can I just say thanks to all our speakers um, for enduring uh, what is uh, in part a white knuckle ride presenting uh, live with a, a remotely controlled screen. Uh, but uh, thanks to the speakers. Uh, thanks to the IT department behind the scenes who are on the call and who kept the show on the road. And of course, thanks very much to you all for joining us. Um, hope you found it interesting. Hope we'll see you again uh, soon. Uh, so that is it from us. <laughs>